This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for the week of June 26th through July 2nd. On this week's show, a cover version of a song becomes the definitive song of an entire genre. Also, the king makes a comeback and takes a bow for the last time, and we celebrate the birthday of an entertainment industry legend. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. This story is a perfect example of how a student can surpass a master. It's also the perfect example of how to do a cover version of a song. In 1928, jazz master King Oliver was at the top of his game. He was selling out concerts in Chicago, Illinois, and making classic recordings with a top-notch band. On June 11th of that year, he recorded a pretty decent version of a song. Now, until 1924, King Oliver had a member of his band who was a pretty good cornet player. This member was a prodigy who studied under Oliver, but at a certain point, A student has to move on, so the teacher and the student amicably parted ways. Between 1924 and 1928, the student left Chicago and also switched instruments, all the while making a name for himself elsewhere. However, the student decided to come back to Chicago for better opportunities. On June 28, 1928, the student walked into a recording studio to record with one of his side project bands. The song he decided to record that day was that song that King Oliver recorded only a few weeks earlier. However, the student didn't simply copy the song. He changed it up a bit. For starters, he completely stripped the opening down to one instrument, his. Then he He improvised that opening. Also, instead of putting any vocals to the song, he did a new form of vocalizing called scat. The song became a big hit. Today, it is considered one of the greatest recordings of any genre and the greatest jazz recording ever made. It heralded jazz as being an art form instead of just a fad. And on that day, the student became the master, and with the master's song no less. Even though both men would record the song many times over their careers, it's that trumpet player Louis Armstrong's version of that song, West End Blues, that is considered the classic, and it was recorded on June 28, 1928. Next, the music industry is full of gimmicks and publicity stunts. You see them all the time. Probably the most fun is when an artist tries to do different concerts in different cities or continents in a single day. There's a few different twists to that little gimmick. During the Live Aid concerts, for instance, Phil Collins played in London, England, and then hopped the Concord supersonic jet, flew to Philadelphia, and played the American concert, becoming the first artist to pull off that trick. In 2006, to celebrate the release of his seventh album, Kingdom Come, Jay-Z set the record for most concerts in the most cities in a 24-hour time period by playing seven concerts in Atlanta, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. Going cross-country, but working the time zone changes to pull it off a little bit. An impressive feat because he spread out the shows and he also played 30-minute concerts. Jay-Z's shows set the Guinness Book of World Records for that particular feat. That record would only last for six years. This next group did it one city better, but they danced within the margins of the rules in order to get it done. In 2012, MTV had a short-lived award show called the O Awards, which honored music and technology. The award show, to be honest, was probably a bit ahead of its time. In any event, MTV decided to have a band break Jay-Z's record. That band was the Flaming Lips. The Guinness rules for the record stated that you only had to play 15-minute concerts, not 30 minutes like Jay-Z did. 
here's where I will state my opinion that playing for 15 minutes does not constitute a concert, but it's not my rule. It's Guinness's, so whatever. In any event, The Flaming Lips started show number one on June 27, 2012 at 5.25 p.m. in Memphis, Tennessee. They played extra at that show because the official Guinness record started at 6.30 p.m. Next stop was in Clarksdale, Mississippi at 9 p.m., then Oxford, Mississippi at 11 p.m. Show 4 was in Jackson, Mississippi around 3.30 a.m. Then it was off to Hattiesburg, Mississippi for a 7.45 a.m. show. Show number 6 was in Biloxi, Mississippi at 10.30 a.m. Then they did a press conference before tying the record with a show in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and then set the record with 20 minutes to spare with a show at the House of Blues in New Orleans, Louisiana. For those of you counting at home, that's three different states in the same exact time zone doing mainly 15-minute shows as opposed to Jay-Z going to seven different states in three different time zones doing 30-minute shows. To me, Jay-Z's record stands as the more impressive feat. To be fair, though, Jay-Z did do a lot of those shows at airport hangars to cut down on travel time. It's not my rule. It's the Guinness Book of World Records, and that's the way it goes. The Flaming Lips, setting the record of eight concerts in eight different cities in 24 hours, June 27th to the 28th, 2012. After the mythical success of the 1985 Live Aid concert, organizers tried to replicate the success and focus on local poverty in poorer countries. On July 2, 2005, the Live 8 concerts, a sequel of sorts to coincide with the 20th anniversary of the original July 13, 1985 Live 8 concerts, took place to raise money and bring awareness to poverty. This set of concerts is not to be confused with the Live Earth concerts, which took place on July 13, 2007 and put a spotlight on climate change. The Live 8 concerts were put on in the countries that comprise the G8 group of nations, i.e. eight of the richest nations in the world, and were timed to happen just before the G8 summit, which was in session that week. It sort of worked. At least the public relations part did. Five days after the concerts on July 7, 2005, The G8 pledged to double the amount of money that they gave to poorer nations in 2004, with half of that money going to African countries. Whether they went through with their pledges, whether the money that they gave in 2004 was anemic at best, so doubling it was still pretty much anemic. After all, what's double zero? Zero. Or whether what they did actually worked? Well... All of those are subject to a whole lot of debate and a completely different podcast than this one. In any event, there was a very valid criticism of the original concert lineup. When organizers first announced who was performing in the different venues, the only non-white performer was Mariah Carey. That rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, especially when the official excuse that was given was that the organizers wanted non-white artists with a global impact because it was a global event and there weren't any other than Mariah Carey. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Uh, It's 2005. Which non-white artists could you have gotten? Let's think think here, aside from, oh, I don't know, Michael Jackson, Prince, Janet Jackson, and a ton of other artists who had global impacts at that time. The organizers finally got the message, got some artists like Kanye for the original set of concerts, and then they also organized another concert in South Africa that featured African artists. The problem with the South African concert, though, was that it was held a decade after apartheid ended, but economic wealth was still mainly with the white minority, so only they could afford the pricey tickets. 
Such is what happens when people forget about the political and social realities of life sometimes. Oh well, at least people at all the concerts were treated to U2, Paul McCartney, a reunion of Pink Floyd, Kanye, Will Smith, Jay-Z and Linkin Park doing a collab, Coldplay, Stevie Wonder, Deep Purple, The Tragically Hip, Green Day, and The Pet Shop Boys. So, good series of concerts, musically at least. The Live 8 Charity Concerts, July 2nd, 2005. In the late 1950s, rockabilly singer Ronnie Hawkins needed a backup touring band. He recruited bass guitarist Rick Danko, keyboardist Garth Hudson and Richard Manuel, guitarist Robbie Robertson, and drummer Levon Helm from other Toronto, Canada bands and named his band The Hawks. The Hawks got good playing the Toronto circuit, so good in fact that they had outgrown Hawkins. In late 1963, they left Hawkins over the usual creative differences excuse, but they didn't break up. Instead, they went out on their own and used various names like Levon and the Hawks. They released a few singles and had even offered to be blues great Sonny Boy Williamson's backup band. Williamson dying not too long after that offer, though, was kind of the end of that whole thing, unfortunately. In 1965, blues singer John Hammond Jr. recommended the Hawks to a guy who was looking for a backup band for his own tour, Bob Dylan. Dylan, after also hearing about the Hawks from his manager's secretary, Mary Martin, went up to Toronto to hear them play. Dylan hired the group right after that. They also stopped being called the Hawks and started going by the name that everybody would soon know them by, The Band. During their 1965-66 to 66 tour, Dylan went from playing acoustic shows to playing electric guitar, which didn't sit well with the folk purists out there, who were outraged. Like, really outraged. During their concert at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester, England, one concertgoer screamed Judas to Bob Dylan, to which Dylan famously answered, Liar, I don't believe you. On July 29, 1966, Dylan got into a really bad motorcycle accident. The injuries were so bad that he had to go into a sort of seclusion at his place in Woodstock, New York. The band, though, continued playing small bars in the meantime, but Dylan needed a little company. He invited the band to join him, so the band rented a house in West Saugerties, New York. They named it Big Pink after the pink color of the place. While they were there, the band started writing and finishing songs for a demo tape that would eventually become a much bootlegged album called The Basement Tapes, which got an official release in the 1970s. After they were done with those songs, they decided that it was time to come out with their own album and stop being known as simply Dylan's backup band. Ironically, even though they wanted to do things on their own, they got a record deal with Capitol Records through the efforts of Dylan's manager, Albert Grossman, who was also their manager. They also kept the name The Band, used three of the songs that Dylan had written for their album, and Dylan did the artwork for the album cover. Before they started recording, though, they had to actually get back Levon Helm, who had gone off to the Gulf of Mexico to work on oil rigs. Once they were done working out the songs in upstate New York, the band went to Manhattan to record at a and Studios in 1968. In two different sessions, they recorded Tears of Rage, Chess Fever, We Can Talk, This Wheel's on Fire, and the classic song The Wait, which gained popularity when they performed it at the original Woodstock Festival. Once Capitol heard the songs, they asked the guys to go to California to finish the album. They recorded at Capitol Studios and also at Gold Star Studios. There, they recorded In a Station, To Kingdom Come, Lonesome Susie, Long Black Veil, and I Shall Be Released. John Simon produced the album. Three engineers were used, Don Hom, Tony May, and Shelley Yakis. Elliot Landy did the photography for Big Pink. 
The album Music from Big Pink, named after that house in upstate New York, was released on July 1st, 1968. Initially, it did okay as it ended up being the 30th biggest album of 1968. The weight was relatively popular, ending up at number 63 on Billboard's Hot 100 Singles Chart, number 35 in Canada, and number 21 in the United Kingdom. It is still, however, considered to be one of the greatest debut albums of all time. The band's debut 1968 Capitol Records release, Music from Big Pink, released July 1st, 1968. There is one honorable mention, but it's an important one. On July 1st, 1979, Sony sold the first cassette Walkman. The importance of this cannot be overstated because from that moment on, Music became more personal, and more importantly, more portable. You no longer had to be in one spot to listen to an LP record, or stay in your car or home, or carry around a boombox or even a transistor radio. Now, you could take your music with you, put on your headphones, and more importantly, Listen to whatever song you wanted to whenever you wanted to without being held hostage to the radio station playlist. It also meant either shoving cassettes into your pants pockets or carrying around briefcases full of cassettes if you were a hardcore listener like I was with my music. There was also the whole thing about getting your cassette tape stuck or eaten by the Walkman. <sighs> good times. Such good times. Hmm. You want to have some family fun one day with your little kids? Try this one on for size. Put a cassette and a pencil next to each other and have them try to figure out what one actually has to do with the other. I look at it as a Mensa member test. If they can figure it out in about 20 seconds, sign that kid up for college courses. I don't care if he's four years old. In any event. Like the iPod over 20 years later... The Walkman technology was a game changer, especially to us music geeks. The first Sony cassette Walkman sold on July 1st, 1979. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcasts. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. In this next segment, we're going to talk about the king of rock and roll, Mr. Elvis Presley. It is said that there are four phases to Elvis's career. The first was when he burst onto the scene full of youth and vigor, shaking his hips, outraging the parents, and stealing the hearts of their daughters. The second was when he was drafted into the army, came out, and did movies. Really big bad movies when you watch them now, but you look back on them fondly as the product of a bygone era. The fourth stage was Vegas Elvis, when he donned the white jumpsuits along with a lot of pounds and pills until he unfortunately passed away. We'll talk to about that fourth stage in a few minutes, but it was an event that happened during this week in 1968 that actually gave him his third phase. By 1968, Elvis was washed up as a rock and roll artist in many people's eyes. Sure, he was doing the movies, but they were campy and definitely about as far removed as you could get from what made Elvis Elvis swagger. Sorry, but Clambake does not have the same swagger as Hound Dog or Don't Be Cruel. Viva Las Vegas? All right, maybe. Also, during his movie phase, he had put on a few pounds. 
Plus, Bob Dylan and the Beatles had stolen the swagger spotlight and rock and roll had changed into hard rock and psychedelic rock. Elvis needed career help fast, or else he was going to become a permanent afterthought banished to the land of, hey, whatever happened to. His manager, Colonel Tom Parker, sold NBC on an idea for a TV special, which was to be a variety special. The director of the show, Steve Binder, saw it a different way. He wanted to do a mini-concert. It was to be a more intimate affair, with Elvis jamming in an intimate setting with his band, where they would joke around and play some songs, of course with a lot of pretty women around them, you know, swagger. Elvis signed onto the concept, but first, dude had to get into shape. He took his wife Priscilla and a then very young Lisa Marie on an extended family vacation in Hawaii. And when they came back, Elvis was tan and, more importantly, trim like his younger self. On the night of June 27, 1968, dressed in his now legendary black leather outfit, they began to record the special. It still almost didn't happen, though. Elvis got a case of stage fright, and even though he was calmed down, if you watch the clips on YouTube, you can actually see how nervous he was at first, especially the way he kept tapping himself in order to try and get himself to calm down. Dude hadn't performed in public in forever. Of course, Elvis being Elvis, those performing instincts kicked back in and the swagger came back. After the success of the special, Elvis started doing concerts again. But unfortunately, a few years later, he fell into the excesses of fame and turned into a caricature Elvis, you know, the Vegas Elvis, basically, uh, right up until his untimely death. Still, for one night in 1968, Elvis did remind people why he is, was, and always will be the king of rock and roll. June 27, 1968, when the king came back and recorded his comeback TV special. Now, after the success of the special, Elvis started doing the concerts. At this time, though, his young marriage to Priscilla Presley started to deteriorate. He also started taking prescription drugs. He had been against drugs like pot, cocaine, and the like, but felt like a lot of people that if a doctor prescribed it for you, then it wasn't illegal and it was okay to take. The Presleys divorced in 1973, which started phase four of his career. By then, his health was in a tailspin. He twice overdosed on barbiturates in 1973. He kept touring during this whole time, found himself a new girlfriend, but really was just not the same. According to members of his band, he would fall out of the limo, taking him to the performances, not being able to stand up. He would lean against the microphone, slurring the words to his song sometimes. He gained weight, an awful lot of it. In short, Elvis was in a pretty bad way. His record label became concerned. Not so much about his health, apparently, but because he wasn't in the recording studio recording albums for them anymore. God, you just gotta love record labels. You really do. His bodyguard started speaking out, but much like what happens when people speak out about such matters, um, they got fired. They went on to write a book about Elvis's drug use that was released only 16 days before his passing, a book Elvis actually tried to have stopped. In 1977, Elvis embarked on a cross-country tour. He started on February 12th in Hollywood, California, then swung east for a bunch of shows before going to Hawaii for a vacation in early March. After his vacation, he came back on the road before he had to cancel some shows towards the end of March due to a stay at Baptist Memorial Hospital on March 31st. At the time, the press were told that it was for fatigue and an intestinal flu. April and May saw him hit the road strong, crisscrossing the country back and forth. Elvis took the first couple of weeks in June off before doing a bunch of shows in the last two weeks of the month. He played Kansas City, Missouri, Omaha, Nebraska, Rapid City, South Dakota, 
Madison, Wisconsin, and Cincinnati, Ohio. On June 26th, 1977, Elvis played at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was an 8.30 p.m. show. He walked out on stage to classical composer Richard Strauss's masterpiece, also Sprach Zarathustra, Opus 30, a.k.a. the theme music for the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. That's usually what people remember it like. Then he went into C.C. Rider Blues, I've Got a Woman, Amen, Love Me, Fairy Tale, You Gave Me a Mountain, Jailhouse Rock, It's Now or Never, Little Sister, Teddy Bear, Don't Be Cruel, Release Me, I Can't Stop Loving You, Bridge Over Troubled Water, Early Morning Rain, What I Say, Johnny Be Good, I Really Don't Want to Know, Hurt, Hound Dog, and finished off with Can't Help Falling in Love. He walked off the stage. The announcer gave the traditional, Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building. And that was it. 21 songs, the vast majority of them being cover songs, no less. He gave one of the best performances of that year. What people couldn't have known at the time, including Elvis, was that it was the last performance he would ever give. Elvis went back home to Graceland. There, he was supposed to rest up and then start the next leg of his tour. He was scheduled to start back up with two shows in Portland, Maine, then shows in Utica, Syracuse, and Uniondale, New York, Hartford, Connecticut, Lexington, Kentucky, Roanoke, Virginia, Fayetteville and Asheville, North Carolina, before finally finishing the month with two shows at the Mid-South Coliseum in his hometown of Memphis, Tennessee. Those shows never happened. The end for Elvis came in an undignified way. On August 16, 1977, while sitting on the toilet in his Graceland mansion, Elvis suddenly had massive pain, stood up for a second, then fell forward, face down. He tried to struggle, but to no avail. His new girlfriend found him, but although attempts were made to revive him, the drugs had taken their toll on his heart. Elvis Presley was pronounced dead from a heart attack brought on by 14 different drugs in his system at 3.30 p.m. on August 16, 1977. After that, of course, came the tributes. Over 100,000 people came to Graceland the next day to pay their respects. Two small funeral services were held at the mansion on August 18th and 19th, and then his body was originally moved to a mausoleum at Forest Hill Midtown Cemetery later that day on August 19th. His mother, who had died earlier, was moved there a week later on August 27th. At the service on August 18th, Minister C.W. Bradley said of Elvis, quote, We are to honor the memory of a man loved by millions, but Elvis was a frail human being, and he would be the first to admit his weaknesses. Perhaps because of his rapid rise to fame and fortune, he was thrown into temptations that some never experience. Elvis would not want anyone to think that he had no flaws or faults. But now he's gone, and I find it more helpful to remember his good qualities, and I hope you do too. End quote. On August 30th, three men were charged with trying to steal Elvis's body. The charges were later dropped due to the court not believing the police's key witness. At that point, though, Elvis's father made the decision to petition the city to allow Elvis and his mother to both be buried at Graceland. On September 28th, the request was granted, and on October 3rd, 1977, Elvis and his mother's bodies were moved to their final resting place at Graceland Mansion. For those of you who wonder who the other celebrities were who passed away around that time, a.k.a. all celebrities die in three theory, and you stretch that theory to the, let's say, the rest of the year, there were three other legends who passed away that year. 
Groucho Marx passed away three days after Elvis on August 19th. Bing Crosby passed away on October 4th from a heart attack after playing a round of golf. And Charlie Chaplin sadly passed away on Christmas Day. The King of Rock and Roll, Elvis Presley's final concert, held at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana, on June 26th, 1977. Time to go through a couple births and passings for the week. This next story concerns one of the most legendary voices of the past 40 years. This man learned to play the piano by ear when he was three years old. When he was a teenager, he was on the very first season of Sesame Street. Yes, that's Sesame Street with Bert, Ernie, Grover, etc., etc. He was singing in a group that performed at the Apollo Theater. He went back to play the Apollo early in his adult life during the infamous Amateur Nights. He was booed off the stage a lot for the record, just so you know. In the early 1970s, he founded the Patti LaBelle Fan Club. He also started doing backup vocals for people like Roberta Flack, Shaka Khan, Barbara Streisand, David Bowie, and Todd Rundgren. He had actually carved out a pretty great career as a backup singer and as a singer for commercials. He was also part of the group Change, who had a gold debut album. However, like most great artists, he wanted more from his career. Finally, he was offered the opportunity to have a solo career. His first album debuted in 1981. It became a huge hit. During his extensive solo career, he amassed 35 million records sold and eight Grammy Awards. One of his Grammys was for Song of the Year, which would sadly be his last. On April 16, 2003, he suffered a stroke, possibly brought on from diabetes and hypertension. He was in a coma for a couple of months, but came out of it, but not for the better. The stroke left him with problems speaking, and he was wheelchair-bound. On July 1st, 2005, the man who sang with David Bowie on the song Young Americans was on Sesame Street and had an extremely successful solo career. Luther Vandross passed away from complications from the stroke. This week's birthday is a legend on many fronts. In her 92 years of life, she was a jazz singer, a dancer, an actress, and a civil rights activist. This Brooklyn, New York native spent her childhood traveling around before finally coming back to New York City. At the age of 16, she started her career as a showgirl at the Cotton Club in New York City, then started performing in nightclubs, including Cafe Society, performed around America with orchestras, and made recordings. Soon, though, the siren call of Hollywood started calling her back. She started doing nightclub acts on the Sunset Strip and started performing in a number of movies. After spending almost a decade making movies and also dealing with the racism in the movie industry, specifically at MGM, she decided to concentrate more on her nightclub career and less on her movie career. She was also caught up with the McCarthy-era anti-communism movement, having been blacklisted by Hollywood after her name was listed on the Red Channel's report. We went over that, actually, on last week's episode of the Music History In-Depth podcast. In fact, after the 1950s, she rarely acted in movies. She found a lot of work doing theater shows and appearing on television variety shows and episodes, winning Grammy Awards and Tony Awards along the way. She was also heavily involved as a civil rights activist long before the civil rights movement of the late 1950s and 1960s. She refused to perform for segregated audiences during World War II, especially when performing for soldiers. She was at the March on Washington in 1963 and worked on various causes with the NAACP. Among the awards that she's won, aside from Grammy Awards and a Tony Award, are an Emmy Award, 
two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one of a select few people who have multiple stars in different categories, by the way, a Kennedy Center Honors, a Drama Desk Award, and she is a member of the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame. This lady was a trendsetter. It is said that she was way too soon for Hollywood. I believe that because of her and people like her, she helped to make the Hollywood careers of so many multicultural people possible. That lady whose signature song is Stormy Weather endured through that storm. The legendary Miss Lena Horn, born June 30th, 1917. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth podcast for June 26th through July 2nd. Thanks for listening. 